So the first thing we want to ask Zach is about Cointel, Cointel Pro and uh, what that was all about, how it started, what their aims were. Just okay, should I put it in the context of Malcolm or don't worry about it? In other words, this no, is more a, background. Just as a generality right now, what, what was the program of Cointel? Who were they targeting and so on and so forth? Okay. Okay, so just go ahead and just start when I want to start. Okay, um, the counterintelligence, you know, program is something that the FBI initiated during, um, the, uh, well, actually, we need to put this in historical context, uh, and probably the first step would be to define what counterintelligence is, because I think a lot of people don't really have an understanding of what counterintelligence is. The best way to do that is to first define what intelligence is. Intelligence simply means acquiring information. And as far as, you know, if you work for an agency, for example, it could be FBI, it could be military intelligence, it could be NYPD or what have you. If your job is to gather intelligence, all that simply means is, you know, you're going to document it, you're going to get any types of you know, any type of information that could then, you know, be used to better evaluate whatever the target is. Counterintelligence is something different, though. Counterintelligence deals with first getting the information and then using the information or using some type of scheme, some type of program, something, some type of technique, some type of activity in order to hurt in order to discredit, in order to disrupt, in order to destroy, or they like to use the term neutralize, which is kind of like an all-encompassing term, which means to weaken to the point that it's no longer a threat. Counterintelligence, you can go all the way back to the turn of the century and you can see aspects of counterintelligence. But when you really begin to see it directed at dissidents in the United States, where I like to begin is probably with the Garvey movement. Those of you, you know, people who have read, for example, the Garvey Papers, um, um, know that J. Edgar Hoover was able to build his reputation during the, you know, post-World War I period by going after Garvey. And in fact, it reached a point whereby the person who would actually introduce Marcus Garvey to the Madison Square Garden you know, conventions that the Universal Negro Improvement Association would hold every year was actually someone who was on the payroll of the agency which became the FBI. You know, they went through a lot of name changes. Um, and of course, that whole you know, mail fraud campaign against Marcus Garvey was actually something that the Justice Department with Hoover and other people actually created. It was a facade. They, you know, Garvey really did not commit mail fraud. But I'm saying all that basically to say that that is when you begin to see his origin, particularly against black people, or I prefer to use the term African peoples. Now, after World War II is when you really begin to see it escalating. And one reason that explains this, A, you had a, you know, the United States, you know, American society at that stage, you know, had a very blatant enemy, communists, the communists. Uh, a, and then B, is after World War II that you really begin to see J. Edgar Hoover beginning to consolidate his own authority, consolidating his own power. Um, so that by the time you get into the middle of the 1950s, the FBI is ready to officialize a counterintelligence program. Now, I say officialize simply because they're going to use techniques that they were already using anyway against other groups, you know, you know, during the war, even before the war, specifically communist groups. But when they initiate the, uh, you know, the first counterintelligence program, or Cointel Pro, as they like to call it, the major target was the Communist Party, USA. And of course, that's going to set the stage for them to then, you know, go after groups like the Socialist Workers' Party in 1961, Ku Klux Klan groups in 1964, uh, the Nation of Islam, which had actually began, you know, decades earlier, et cetera, et cetera, accumulating in the most visible and the most prominent, you know, the black nationalist hate-type groupings of the late 1960s. Now, one of the unique features of counterintelligence is that the bottom line is to use anything that you can use in order to 
destroy your enemy. And I think that for the average person, it's difficult for them to really begin to put, you know, to, to really understand what that means. Uh, I think one former FBI agent probably put it best. Uh, that was Arthur Murtaugh, who was, you know, who used to, you know, who used to work for the Atlanta office during the King era. And one of the points that he said is that you must realize that counterintelligence operators, you know, that is those people who are, you know, those agents who are involved in counterintelligence. He said they have fiendish minds. And what he was saying that is, is that, is that an operation will be successful or unsuccessful depending upon how diabolical a scheme they could come up with. Now, one of the keys to counterintelligence, though, is to plant a seed and then to rely upon people to react to that seed a certain way. And if they give you the reaction that you want, then a lot of times that will accumulate in you achieving your goal. Now, another point that you want to be clear on is that, is that one of the things that counterintelligence has, has used for a very long time is simply to exploit existing weaknesses of people. Jealousies and envies, personality conflicts, um, anything that they could use in order to weaken a target groups like the FBI historically have used. And remember too, the best counterintelligence operation is those operations in which the intelligence agency, be it FBI, be it CIA, always remains in the background. In fact, the very best, as one former CIA official said, the very best counterintelligence operations are those that remain secret from inception to eternity. Now, what this does for people like myself is it makes it very difficult sometimes trying to uncover it. Because remember now, the best type of counterintelligence that you're going to find, you're, we're not supposed to know. I'm not supposed to know about it, and you're not supposed to know about it. And the people that are being targeted in it, they're not supposed to know about it either. And so that makes it very difficult for us to then begin to piece things together. And of course, that's very consistent with the concept of plausible denial. And of course, plausible denial is something that the intelligence community has developed. And this is simply a very unique, a very sophisticated way to deny their participation, their knowledge of operations, which are generally illegal, immoral, unethical because most counterintelligence activities that you find are one of the above. Immoral, illegal, unethical. Um, and of course you don't have to be a genius to figure out why you know plausible denial exists. The other reason that it exists is that it's a protection, if you will, um, for senior officials who do not have to you know, be connected to some of these schemes. And one of the, uh, there are basically two major, I'm going into detail, so, you know, edit, you know, what you need. But there are two major ways that very sickening counterintelligence schemes are authorized by senior officials. One is, of course, euphemisms. And that's simply when you use real nice terms in order to order something that's not real nice. You know, um, classic, classic example, um, classic example, August 18th, 1960, National Security Council meeting. Um, Dwight D. Eisenhower is there and several other senior officials, and they're talking about Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. CIA Director Alan Dulles is there, too. And Eisenhower, who represents the highest authority in any type of counterintelligence scheme. In fact, in the intelligence community, the president represents the highest authority. He stops the meeting when they're talking about Lumumba. He looks at Alan Dulles, and he tells Alan Dulles, Patrice Lumumba is one man. One man cannot stop the United States government from implementing policy. Alice Dulles, Alan Dulles, who has been trained to pick up the energy, because remember, the, the whole key to plausible denial and authorizing you know, these messages is the energy that you receive from a senior official. He picked up the energy, left the meeting, immediately authorized assassination. 
of Patrice Lumumba and, and sent it down the channels saying he had the highest authority. Well, that's how that works. And see, later on, what happened is actually what's supposed to happen. Later on, when they had a congressional hearing in which these allegations were made, all but one person in that entire meeting who was still alive said that he thought that was an, an assassination order. Everybody else who was interviewed, who testified in the hearing, they said, no, he just made a statement that he was just one man. That's how it's supposed to work. And therefore, plausible denial is intact. That one person who interpreted was a man by the name of Robert Johnson, he was a very perceptive person because he should not, if they did it right, he should not have even interpreted that evidence as an assassination order. Now, the final point is that, or shall I say, the second way that a very sensitive counterintelligence operation is authorized is what is known as circumlocution. That's when you simply beat around the bush. You know, you want something done, you won't say, I want you to kill such and such. You say, you know, such and such really would be real nice. I mean, you know, suppose it was two men and one of these men you didn't really like that well and you just wish something bad would happen to him. Something real simple, ridiculous like that. But if you say that to the wrong person at the right time, it could be deemed as an assassination order. And we have cases like that in the United States government. So to kind of bring some type of closure to this, the only way that we're going to understand counterintelligence is for us to realize that, A, the sky was the limit as one former you know, uh, FBI informant said, he, he said, this, you know, that, um, that the sky was basically the limit. Anything, if it could bring results, that's all they cared about. If it meant, for example, somebody getting killed, that didn't matter. If it meant that the person ended up, you know, going to jail for something that they didn't do, it didn't matter. If it, mean, uh, if it meant burning down buildings, or arson, it didn't matter. If it meant breaking in people's, if it meant, you know, getting information about someone's sex life and then circulating it or using it as a form, uh, you know, of blackmail or white male, depending on what side of the fence you're on, it didn't matter. And that's how counterintelligence worked. And of course, we're going to see this in Malcolm's assassination. We're going to see counterintelligence in the King assassination. We're going to see counterintelligence in many of the government sponsored, um, you know, um, assassinations during the 1960s. Now, counterintelligence inside the Nation of Islam, there were certain schemes that they used which were actually very similar to, you know, to the schemes that they used against the Communist Party, the Socialist Workers, and the truth of the matter is, is damn near anybody else that either Hoover or some of Hoover's people didn't like because you know, people like to keep this very sophisticated, you know, as to who the Bureau was targeting. The truth of the matter is, is that there wasn't a, a lot of times a lot of sophistication in it at all. If you didn't like them for, for whatever reason, that was enough. Or if you suspected something, that was enough. It didn't matter whether or not the person was affiliated with, you know, I mean, it, it, couldn't be, it could be due not just to their politics, it could be due to some other, you know, uh, preferences or, ref, you know, or what have you. So let's be very clear on that. Now, what were some of the counterintelligence schemes that the Bureau used as far as the Nation of Islam is concerned? Well, first off, they like to write bogus letters. Now, what's a bogus letter? Well, you know, a bogus letter is simply a letter that the Bureau would write, but they would generally sign it, you know, as though they were a member, you know, in most cases, of the Nation of Islam, or, or sometimes just a friend of the FBI, you know, I mean, excuse me, a friend of the nation who was trying to tip them of something that was going on with another member or something like that. Now, one of the unique things that the Bureau liked to do, you know, which helped to cause division inside the ranks of the leadership of the nation, and we see this, for example, you can go back to February 1964. One of the things that the Bureau did in, in February 1964, in fact, they did it more than once in February, they would draft a letter. Um, Use, you know, and in February 1964, uh, that was very critical of Malcolm. And then what they would do is they would then send the letter to some of Malcolm's enemies inside the ranks of the national leadership. So much so that Elijah Muhammad, having received one of them, thought that Malcolm actually wrote the letter, which was kind of ironic if you think about it, because anybody who reads the letter can see that Malcolm is being attacked in the letter. So that didn't make a lot of sense. But 
the Bureau didn't particularly care. All they wanted was for you to think that this is a legitimate letter, take the information in it seriously, and if it can plant a seed of dissension, if it can plant a seed uh, that could, you know, that could cause some type of division, it was a successful counterintelligence apparatus. Now, something else that the Bureau also did, as far as the nation, which was vintage FBI, was they planted newspaper articles. Um, one of the things that the that Hoover learned very early on was the importance of having friendly reporters, you know, which is what they call them, or certified friends of the FBI. And these were simply reporters who so much appreciated the Bureau that when the Bureau needed a certain article written that covered a certain area with a certain focus, which mentioned certain information, they could drop it in the lap of these friends, and these friends would either go verbatim, carbon copy it, or in some instances they just modify it a little bit, but make the same point in their own words, et cetera, et cetera. The Bureau circulated and planted several newspaper articles. At, in fact, there was one that was planted in 1960, which was designed to show that Elijah Muhammad you know, was committing a, a, um, adultery, as they called it. But you especially see it in 1963 and 1964, when they were trying to create more division between Malcolm and the Nation of Islam leadership. So that was another technique. A third technique was, of course, paying informants. Now, we need to make a distinction, however, here, which I think is very important, between a paid informant, or I prefer to use the term asset. That's really more of a CIA word, but I use it for the entire in intelligence apparatus. A paid informant and an agent. The agents were those people you know, who were actually trained within the apparatus of the intelligence community. The informant was someone who generally, what they like to do would be to recruit someone who's already in the organization. And how do they do that? Well, what they would do is they would begin to study and begin to isolate certain people. And usually this happens after they already have somebody already in there. Or sometimes they would do it through their monitoring, you know, that is through the phone taps, you know, through the wire taps or what have you. And if, if, if they pick up energy that a certain person has the potential because of something he might say or because of that person's predicament, maybe the person has been struggling financially, you know that. Whatever it is, if you think that that person um, might be interested, then what the Bureau would do would be they would approach the person. They wouldn't throw down, a, you know, or they wouldn't show them a whole lot of cards. they just say, you know, uh, we were wondering we know your financial situation, uh, uh, and we were wondering whether or not you might be interested in, you know, doing your country a service. Uh, all we're interested in is just information. Uh, you wouldn't have to do anything crazy or anything like that. And if the person's initial reaction would be, mm, keep going, then they would figure that they might, you know, have a good opportunity. If the person responds says, hey, you got the wrong person, man, let me get out of here, uh, then they run the risk of them blowing their cover. And then, of course, they would expect that person to, to then go back and alert, you know, hey, man, I was just approached by the Bureau, man, they're trying to get somebody in here, so we need to be on, on our P's and Q's. But they would generally put enough research and enough time in the people that they were interested in before they approached them, whereby they would generally be pretty sure that this person might bite. So, at any rate, paid informants was another technique that the Bureau would use, that most intelligence apparatuses would use. And then their job would simply be to attend meetings, to attend functions, to report on any information that they can get. They were especially interested in information that could be exploited, dissension. You know, for example, at the last meeting we had, it looked like there was conflict between Malcolm and Raymond Sharif. You know, Malcolm seemed to be very angry every time Sharif said something like that. That would be the type of information that would then be forwarded back to the, um, you know, control agents, it was the control agents' job, they were the ones who the informants would usually report to. Um, and then again, once that happened, then the Bureau or some other agency would then say, how can we exploit this? A fourth technique would be the spreading of rumors, usually false rumors. Um, and of course, you had to be a genius to figure this one out. 
the rumor, the importance of the rumor would be, it would have to be something that could either discredit the person, isolate the person, separate the person, or in some way impact on the person or persons that the rumor is designed to affect. And a lot of times it was the Bureau's assets or the informant's job to do that, even though you know, they use other sources as well. I mean, I mean, rumors you know, are usually very easy to start anyway. So that was another technique. Of course, you know, wiring buildings, offices, bedrooms, hotels, it ran the gamut. That was a major source of information for groups like the FBI. And of course, they had people monitoring information, and then they would then transcribe it on to paper. And um, this information would then become very valuable when they needed to exploit something. A lot of times they would take it straight off of that, give you an excellent case in point. In the case of Malcolm, if you go back to 1963, one of the ways that the Bureau realized that they needed to escalate their newspaper campaign against Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam was that damn near every day when Elijah Muhammad was talking on his phone, somebody would be talking about a newspaper article or he was talking about a newspaper article. Well, that told them, these people are really reading these newspapers. Have you heard there was an article in the, in the you know, Pittsburgh Courier that talked about how we were having our convention down there this year and how people were getting excited. And I also read an article in the, in the New York Post, which was very critical of us, da, da, da. That told the New York SAC, special agent in charge, Marlon Johnson, that we needed to put more emphasis on these newspaper campaigns. So of course, the Bureau is gonna be very very, very interested in, you know, in monitoring information, you know, like that. Um, the phone tap, I kind of, you know, mentioned that. That was another technique that they would use. The snitch jacket or bad jacketing, and that's simply when they put out a specified rumor, usually that the person was a police informant, an FBI informant, a CIA informant. And we've had some very devastating results of that. Uh, you know, if you read, for example, um, the Moth Perry, he was one of the most prominent of the FBI and the New York, and the LAPD uh, informants. And he talks about a case in which you know he had infiltrated the Panthers, and they were driving up the mountains in Southern California, and somebody it was like him and about four or five other brothers, Black Panthers, and one of them said, "We got a." agent in this car. And of course, he assumed it was him because he really was an agent. But what had happened was they had put a snitch jacket on one of the other brothers who really wasn't an agent. And what they ended up doing was taking that brother up into the mountains and they shot him, killed him. Uh, that is, of course, one of the repercussions of the snitch jacket. And what the Bureau would do when after that happened, the Bureau patted itself on the back and said, we need to escalate this. This can work. Let's do it more. That's how sickening, you know, the intelligence apparatus is. Um, and so that was a very Im important, um, you know, mechanism that, the, that groups like the FBI, you know, also use. And of course, misinformation or disinformation in general. That's, that's when they would just simply use the media, use, you know, different sources in order to just put out false information in order to sway people to think alone you know, certain lines and things like that. So that was also a very significant. And of course, I guess finally, we could say more, but of course, arson was also used. Um, in fact, one of DeMoth Perry's, you know, he was ordered in 1974 to burn down the Watts workshop, which he did, by his FBI control agent. Why? Because that was one of the things, you know, that came out of the Watts Rebellion of 1965, one of the more positive things that came out of it. And the Bureau thought that, you know, it was harboring some type of, you know, dissidents and, and militants were coming there and, 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 and it was getting too much positive play, so they burned it down. Um, well, let's talk about some of the documents that you've dug out. You can, you can tell any specifics that are really interesting in some of the documents that Okay, um, as far as, you know, FBI documentation is concerned, um, we need to, first we need to be clear on, on something. 
generally, you're not going to find any smoking guns in the intelligence apparatus, primarily because, well, for, for several reasons, but the most important is that the Freedom of Information Act allows agencies to destroy or to delete or to withhold any information that might fall under various broad categories. Now, the reason that we need to say that is that some people are expecting to see a document saying, I, FBI agent, hereby orders the assassination of Malcolm X or Martin Luther King or John Kennedy or something like that. And you know, that's, that's just kind of like ridiculous. Now, one thing though that does happen a lot of times is that if you're looking for crumbs, because generally the documents that are released generally are crumbs at best. But if you're looking for the crumbs and you're able to begin to piece together the crumbs, then before you know it, you could actually put together a loaf. And that's what people like me, you know, this is what I've had to do specifically with FBI documents. Now, what are some of the more significant documents that I've been able to come across? Well, first off, the March 11th, 1963 document from the Chicago SAC to Hoover, I've deemed probably the most important. This is in Malcolm's New York file, because in, in this document, they actually outlined the disruption campaign that ultimately led to Malcolm's separation from Elijah Muhammad. And remember, I didn't say, from Malcolm getting kicked out of the nation. I said Malcolm being separated from Elijah Muhammad. The difference, the reason that I make this distinction is that the whole key to Malcolm being, you know, the whole key to Malcolm departing the nation of Islam was because of his being separated from Elijah Muhammad. And the Bureau is gonna play uh, a, you know, an Im important role in that even though I think that the major role was actually played by Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad, you know, because there were challenges, there were differences, and unfortunately there were differences which they themselves never ultimately talked out themselves. As long as there was separation, that is physical separation between them two, it allowed for the differences to be escalated, to be exploited, and that's ultimately what's going to happen to them. But at any rate, the, moth, the March 11 document is very important because the Bureau also talks about some of the things that they were considering doing and, and which they actually had already done before and which they did later as well. Things like making bogus telephone calls, um, you know, newspaper, they announced their newspaper campaign as well. And they also outlined how they were going to rely upon the problem between Malcolm's, excuse me, between Elijah Muhammad's family and the Nation of Islam. I mean, excuse me, between Elijah Muhammad's family and Malcolm. That was the whole key to the Bureau's disruption or counterintelligence, if you will, campaign against the Nation of Islam. They realized very early on, in fact, going all the way back to the late 50s, they realized that there was personality conflict between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad's family. And they also realized that that, that was not going to end soon. Why? Because probably the heart of the problem between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad's family um, was the whole question of secession. That is, who was going to take over the nation when Elijah Muhammad left this plane? And of course, Elijah Muhammad's family thought that uh, the secession would come from among one of them. Everybody else, or mostly everybody else, thought that it should be Malcolm. And Elijah Muhammad generally would hint it was going to be Malcolm. Right, and the is everybody from New York? Yeah, I grew up here. He's from, uh, I'm from the Bronx. Okay. I'm from California. Where about? L.A. Oh, really? I was in L.A. I guess it was what, last year. I, I used to go out there to speak. Are you from Maryland? Most every year. No, actually, I'm from Virginia. From Newport News, Virginia. You know, near um, Hampton. I want to talk, uh, he was okay. talking about the succession of um, right. who was gonna who was gonna be succeeding okay. into Elijah Muhammad's spot, whether it was the rift family. between the family and Malcolm. Right. And what became significant about this is that Elijah Muhammad was the mediator in all of this. See, he knew, in fact, he even told Malcolm once or twice that he knew Malcolm had problems with some of his family members. Hell, he had problems with some of his family members. Um, but what's going to happen is, is that 
During the early 60s, Elijah Muhammad is going to be the voice of reason in all of that. But then through various techniques, through the exploitation of some of his own challenges with Malcolm, et cetera, et cetera, maybe some of the things that Malcolm himself may have been doing, which was interpreted or misinterpreted, depending on you know, how you looked at it. By the time you get to 1963, Elijah Muhammad himself is beginning to entertain some of these ideals. And he's becoming less of a mediator and more of an activist in all of this. And of course, between Malcolm, who had been his son, and his family, his blood relatives, you know, he decided in the end that he was more the patriarch of the Muhammad family than he was the mentor and the savior of Malcolm. Um, and so once he begins to become active in this power struggle, and, and you know, we're kind of beating around the bush, but really, what we're talking about really is a power struggle, you know. And it had different variables that I think are significant. One variable was that Malcolm, you know, Malcolm wanted to make the nation more active in the struggle of, of African peoples. He wanted them to be, you know, it, it hurt him to hear people say, the Muslims talk tough. But they don't do nothing unless one of them is involved. And sometimes they don't even do it when, you know, I mean, sometimes they let cops beat them up and they don't even do nothing. That used to bother Malcolm. So he wanted to make the nation much more involved in the struggle of African peoples. On the other hand, the family, remember now, by the time you got to the early 60s, uh, they were wealthy, very wealthy. And, you know, wealth has a way of promoting conservatism. Um, and the, the last thing that many of them wanted to do would be to do something that might jeopardize this money. I mean, hey, if we start to get more active, you know, the government might want to tax us and our properties and putting us under tighter scrutiny, you know. These are all issues that are going to play a role somewhere in all of this. But the bottom line was that because of this power struggle, Elijah Muhammad is, is ultimately going to, you know, participate. And when he participated, Malcolm is going to be the odd man out. Uh, and what's interesting is that, and I think that my book does a good job of just kind of documenting, particularly 1963. And what happened was, by the time you got to the fall of 1963, the writing was on the wall. Um, there were certain things that, were, that the Bureau exploited, certain things even that Malcolm's family would exploit in the conflict. Now, what was the conflict and what were some of the things that they exploited between, but spe specifically, Elijah Muhammad? A, they realized that Elijah Muhammad seemed to have had some insecurities as far as Malcolm's age and his age. In other words, the age difference bothered him, particularly when people would say things like, he's an old man on his way out, Malcolm's a young man on his way in, that bothered him. And another thing that bothered him was, you know, this thing about Malcolm being the heir apparent, or Malcolm being the number two Muslim, and things like that, that bothered Elijah Muhammad. Another thing, you know, that bothered Elijah Muhammad was that, you know, Malcolm was trying to make the nation more militant. Malcolm was trying to make the nation more active in things. He said, no, we're not a political movement, we are a religious movement. So that would bother Elijah Muhammad um, as well. And so, these are the things that are human tendencies, but that the Bureau are going to make sure they can get more, you know, rumors being circulated, newspaper coverage of this. Um, and ultimately, you know, these are going to be some of the things. I think that it was more complex than that, but these are going to be some of the things that by the time you got to the fall of 1963, Elijah Muhammad you know, had been hearing a lot of things. Malcolm was disobedient. You know, he, he, he was also worried that he had given Malcolm too much, too much authority. And in fact, on several occasions, he would remark that Malcolm had let power go to his head and this and that. And during the fall of 1963, it reached a point whereby Elijah was looking to test Malcolm. You know, all these things had reached her head. And I think that ultimately, the Kennedy assassination became a test because Elijah Muhammad sent down directives. It's very clear, he sent them down. Uh, you know, he didn't want people commenting. In fact, I came across one conversation that took place 
on uh, November 24th, two days after the assassination, in which the la you know Malcolm was talking to Elijah Muhammad about an upcoming speech Malcolm was going to give. And the last thing Elijah Muhammad said is, remember, no comment on the kid assassinated. Malcolm said, yes, sir. <laughs> and of course, we know what happened, uh, you know, uh, a week later. Um, but that was a test. And I think that if it wasn't the Kennedy assassination, it would, it would have been something else. But at that stage of the game, there was enough problems and dissension and weaknesses in the relationship between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad that if not that, something was going to test it. And if Malcolm did not fly, you know, if he didn't pass with flying colors, he was going to be the odd man out. And again, the Kennedy assassination was a smoke screen. Some people like to say, you know, I've, I've, I've heard people today say, well, if he had kept his mouth shut, he probably would have still been in. Uh, hell no. It was much more complex than that. It would have been the next thing. Excuse me, Anna Kennedy. The various theories, I believe, you know, if there's, in Evan's book, he talks about three theories. I don't know if you could break down those theories, pull them, uh, take them apart, and then, get, and then give us your view of the actual who did it, from what direction, and the names, where they met, who was where. I mean, the, the okay. codes. Okay, okay. <clears throat> you know, over the past three decades, there's been considerable, de you know, debate, you know, over who killed Malcolm. And there's been, I guess, four major theses out there. One thesis was that the Nation of Islam killed him, and that was best advocated, I think, by Peter Goldman. Another theory is, of course, CIA killed Malcolm. Um, and, you know, that's been advocated first by Eric Norton, who wrote us, you know, a couple articles in 1967 uh, in The Realist and in, in, in 1978 in uh, Penthouse, and which Carl Evans' book generally supports. Another thesis was that the mafia killed him. And of course, that was uh, most advanced by James Farmer, which he later admitted was more smokescreen to prevent conflict between Malcolm's group and Elias Muhammad's group right after the assassination. Although there is one element in this, though, that I think is important, which I would probably want to say something about. And then, of course, the third group, uh, the fourth group, of course, would be FBI, and and, um, and then the fifth group would be a combination of of some of these. And I guess the sixth would be. Uh, the NYPD, you know, or NYPD in conjunction with some of these other groups. So those are the, the general theories of the assassination of Malcolm X. The problem with most of these theories, though, is first off, let's deal with uh, Peter Goldman. Um, in the first edition of the, the uh, Death and Life of Malcolm X published in 1973, Goldman, of course, you know, had, you know, he takes a very narrow view of the assassination. Um, and one thing is clear, um, there were too many complexities in Malcolm's assassination to be explained only by the Nation of Islam by itself, which, you know, he later admits in the second edition of his book, which was published in 1978, not, excuse me, 1979, called Afterthoughts, in which he then brought in, you know, he, he went into the prison and interviewed two innocent men, et cetera. And so that's not going to take us very far because, um, you know, if the nation killed Malcolm, that's one thing. But then, as Goldman's second edition argues, then we kind of have to explain then, you know, why was it that two innocent men ended up going to prison? You know, Butler and Johnson did no more kill Malcolm than I killed Malcolm. I was five years old when Malcolm was killed. Uh, and of course, now, Goldman deals with that, though, by saying that the NYPD simply got the wrong men. Um, the problem with that is, is that we have um, several people, and probably most importantly, uh, a man by the name of Ronald, Ronald Timberlake, who was one of the star witnesses during the trial. And in, in his testimony, you know, they, they first cleared the court because he claimed that his life was in danger. But anyway, in 1980, he was interviewed for 60 Minutes, and he said that the police lineup at which he identified Butler was, con you know, was contrived, was a phony, a setup by members of the NYPD. And of course, Goldman, unfortunately, because 
you know, he got very close to the police on the, you know, case, you know, who were investigating Malcolm's assassination. You know, Goldman, you know, had nothing but plaudits for them. You know, they did a great job on a difficult circumstance, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, is that they did a very inadequate job as far as the, in, the investigation is concerned. And as Timberlake has basically alluded to, because I have, if you read the trial transcript too, by the way, one other witness, a man by the name of Davis, he also talks about the police lineup when he identified Butler. And based upon what he said, it was an incredible setup. You know, in fact, I, I would just let you, t you know, know real quickly how he did it. He said that what happened was he was brought into this room and it was connected to another room that had just a peephole. Now, one of the things that the NYPD did in order to, to actually frame Butler is one of the assassins, the person who had the 38, he had a, a salt and pepper tweed. He wore a salt and pepper tweed, which a few witnesses talked about after the assassination. Butler happened to have a similar coat. And what they did was they had Butler, when he was in the police lineup, to wear that salt and pepper tweed, which is very unusual, you know. But at the same time, they also had five or six police detectives, black police detectives and you know, cops in plain clothes, who were also part of the police lineup. And this is what this man, Davis, when he testified in the trial, he said this is what he was told. He said, what we want you to do is to look into the room and see whether or not you see the man who you know who you remember sitting you know you know as you know as one of the assassins of Malcolm. But he said that what happened was when he looked into the thing, into the peephole, the person who was with him, you know, the supervisor or whatever the hell he was, he said, "Is Butler the man in the tweed coat?" that you saw shoot Malcolm? He said, yeah, fine, that's it. In other words, you have just led this person. You didn't say, so tell me, so, you know, does anything look familiar? In other words, you gave presidential, you know, prejudicial, presidential information. That's ridiculous. You don't do something like that in a police lineup. But apparently this is what Timberlake, apparently this is what happened with, with Timberlake as well, and this is apparently what he's alluding to when he said the police lineup was contrived. And the whole key, you know, I think, more than anything, was that damn coat. If he had on any other coat, it's not clear if that person would have identified Butler. And again, you're basically leading the witnesses when you do stuff like that. You're not supposed to do something like that, unless all of them had on the same coat or something like that. So anyway, those were the types of games, you know, that was, um, you know, basically being played. So now, as far as CIA is concerned, the CIA, unfortunately, we have to rely too much upon CIA documents, which, you know, don't give you nothing. So to argue a case based on, CIA, you know, on the CIA, what we need more than anything is a CIA agent or somebody, and we just don't have any evidence. We have to infer too damn much. We have to jump to conclusions too damn much to, to, to dig up any evidence that the CIA was on the case of Malcolm, other than perhaps, perhaps poisoning him, um, perhaps having something to do with why he was not allowed to speak in France on February 9th, 1965, two weeks before his assassination. Uh, but beyond that, we just, you know, I, you know, we would like to, because my, my overall philosophy when it comes to CIA is, is that chances are they did it. They did any damn thing. You know, I've never studied a group that was as, as vicious as the CIA, but you still need evidence, even for the CIA. We don't have no evidence, really, for the CIA. As far as the NYPD is concerned, too many, you know, clearly they played a role in, in, in getting two men convicted, along with the, you know, prosecutor's office is concerned. Clearly their security was inept at best. Um, um, and, you know, you know, clearly we could, you know, say that they were negligent. But as far as them killing Malcolm is concerned, or, or being behind Malcolm's assassination, um, I think we'd be hard pressed. Again, because of, of, of evidence would be one major thing. Um, 
And then B, we'd be hard pressed really even to have a significant motive. Because remember now, the even though Boss or Bossy had a very unique role among city intelligence units, um, and we know that they were involved in you know sp you know in certain certain activities, counter intelligence act activities against so-called subversive groups in New York City. Most notably, you know, a week before Malcolm was killed, you know, they had a big write-up in the paper about the Black Liberation Front that Bossy, you know, a boss agent by the name of Alfonso Wood broke up. Actually, you know, it was, to me it was a clear case of entrapment, but that's beside the point. Uh, at, at, at any rate, um, the motive is a little bit lacking, you know, other than just to say, well, he was a, a subversive and that's why they would want to take Malcolm out. Um, and then, of course, we would also have to somehow connect the NYPD and, in fact, CIA, in fact, all of the different groups that we've named, we would have to connect them directly to the men who fired the guns. And, of course, if you, if you want to get very, very clandestine about it, you could say, well, you know, they were all agents, or most of them were agents, or one of them was an agent. I don't have no evidence of that. I think that these were just hardcore members who believed in the Nation of Islam, they believed in the organization of the Nation of Islam, they believed in the divinity of Elijah Muhammad, and they basically did what they did out of their love for him. I've been able to identify more information about four of them, and I'm convinced these were just hardcore Muslims, no less loyal than Captain Joseph, who died a few months ago, or you know, no less loyal than other people who, you know, died, you know, went to their grave talking and praising Elijah Muhammad and teed off that the nation, you know, split after Elijah Muhammad died. And of course, then there's the FBI. Um, my evidence shows that the FBI's role in everything was basically just clandestine, behind the scenes. All they simply, in other words, they didn't kill Malcolm per se. All they did was they helped to create the atmosphere for him to be killed by simply exploiting existing weaknesses, existing conditions. And then at that stage, they realized where it was going to lead to. And instead of stopping or pulling back, they just kept on going, which, you know, from their standpoint, freed them from responsibility because, you know, that's one of their pet peeves you know, that the intelligence apparatus, you know, you can't, my hands ain't bloody. I don't got no blood on my hand. It's not my job to protect people when they got eternal differences and, you know, and inter nice and warfare between them. It's not my fault. That's always been the position that the intelligence community takes, whether it was, it was once they created, you know, once they exploited a war between the Panthers, for example, and the Blackstone Rangers or the Panthers and the US organization, they just sit in the background and just count the bodies. But when you say, well, you played a role in all this, they say, no, no, uh -uh, uh -uh. you can't put that on us. We didn't, you know, show me where one of my men fired a gun. And the Bureau took the same, they played the same role in Malcolm's assassination. In other words, understand, they studied the nation well enough to know how people thought. They knew, for example, that the nation did things like the intelligence community. They acted on post-suggestion, circumlocution, euphemism. In other words, it was based upon somebody, an official, putting out a certain energy, and the FOI person interpreting the energy, and then acting on their own. That was how the FOI was structured, which is similar to the FBI, the CIA, and any other in intelligence apparatus. And the Bureau has studied the nation well enough to know that if the conflict continued to grow, it could lead into some very violent areas. And again, they continued it. They didn't, we have no evidence that they stopped it, that they stopped doing what they were doing. They continued it to the degree that they did knew that it was going to lead to it, to violence. They allowed the violence to happen. Then they played a role in framing innocent people then they played a role in making the investigation uh, a very narrow, at best, operation. So to kind of you know, bring some closure here, to me it's very clear that it was counterintelligence and one of its most sophisticated. Why? Because they allow for the subjects to do the bulk of the work. And therefore, it's going to make it very difficult years later 
for someone like me to come along and then say, no, you did this, you did this, you did that, and then it, it therefore led to that. Because what it allows them to do is, you know, is to say, well, you'd have to stretch your imagination. But again, if you study the intelligence community, they did, in many ways, it was the perfect counterintelligence operation. The names, um, how they met each other, where they met, what their plans were the day, uh, the day before. Did they rehearse the, the assassination? Who were these men? Have you ever met them yourself? Mm -hmm. What's your experiences? Run the whole gamut if you could for us, please. Yeah. As far as the assassination is concerned, um, I need to make a couple of points foundation points to start with. First off, the team that killed Malcolm, we should not assume that the team that actually killed Malcolm was the only team that was working to kill Malcolm. Based upon what I've been able to uncover, there were several assassin teams out there. It's just that the team that came out of Newark that ultimately killed him um, had their opportunity before the rest of them did. A few of them had opportunities and they just blew it, but by and, and large, it seems real clear to me that the Newark team was probably the most serious, they were the most active, and because of the vicinity between Newark and New York, they also had the, the most strategic accessibility as well. Now, according to Talmadge Hare's testimony, and we have to rely uh, quite a bit on his testimony, um, which he you know, gave during a later part of the 1970s. Um, his team, which ultimately became the assassination team, first began to organize about a month or so before Elijah Muhammad spoke at the armory, which was, Elijah Muhammad spoke on the armory on June 28, 1964. So you're talking about late May 1964. And he said what had happened was, you know, he himself had been a member of Mosque Number 25, but he had been in and out as far as good standing. You know, he, he would be in good standing here this time, and then he'd do something, rough up a guy or something like that. He'd be in bad standing. He also, in 1963, you know, he had been arrested for, you know, stealing guns, him and several other people. And apparently this is going to be important in his selection uh, because, um, he had a reputation of being somebody who would take chances, who would you know, take risks. So he said one day, um, and then the other thing is that the people who organized it knew that he loved Elijah Muhammad and he didn't want anybody to say anything real negative about Elijah Muhammad. At any rate, one day he was walking down the street in Patterson, New Jersey, two other brothers from the mosque who he knew as members, um, Ben Thomas, who was about 28 at the time, and he was the assistant secretary of Moss number 25, and Leon Davis, who was just an FOI member, and he was like the youngest member of the assassination group. They drove down the street and called him to their car, and they began to ask him questions about, you know, what he thought about the conflict between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad, the things that Malcolm, you know, this was, you know, this is when the babies thing, a lot of negative rumors were being going about about the babies, and Malcolm had already been deemed the chief, hip, you know, the chief hypocrite, a Judas, a heretic, and all these other things. And Hare began to answer, apparently saying the things that they wanted to hear. You know, something needs, you know, this is bad. Something needs to be done. Da 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 da. And so, in a short period of time, they recruited two other brothers, Willie Bradley, who ultimately fired the shotgun. He's about 28. He was known in Newark as the Stick Up Man. Um, and uh, Wilbur McKinley, or Kinley, or Mud Kinley, Hare never was really sure on what his name was, but he was the oldest member of the assassination team, and you know he owned like a construction company in the area. Longtime member of the Newark uh, Newark community. At any rate, he said by June, by early June, apparently these these four men, excuse me, these five men had decided that they wanted to take Malcolm out. And he said that they would meet periodically 
They would discuss certain things. And then what happened was, of course, Malcolm left for Africa on, on July 9th, 1964, and he's going to be there until late November 1964. So he said that while Malcolm was in Africa, they just kind of placed things on hold. You know, they just placed things on hold. But then, once Malcolm returned, to take Malcolm out. And he said that they would meet periodically, they would discuss certain things, and then what happened was, of course, Malcolm left for Africa on, on July 9th, 1964, and he's going to be there until late November 1964. So he said that while Malcolm was in Africa, they just kind of placed things on hold, you know, they just placed things on hold. But then, once Malcolm returned, they reactivated it. In 1965, um, he said they came up with different strategies. You know, once they talked about why don't we just go there and, you know, to, let's just go to his home. And so they drove out to his home one night and they said it was heavily guarded. So they said, that's not a good idea. Ultimately, they decided, and remember now, Hare is a foot soldier in all of this. He's not only inside of who is taking orders from whom. What he always thought was that Ben, because Ben was an official, was the, you know, and because Ben, you know, was the major person who was kind of like, who called him into it, along with Davis, he always assumed that Ben Thomas was taking orders from someone else. But it wasn't his, his job or his place to ask, to inquire why, where, how, who. He never did. But according to Hare, what they ended up doing was the Night before the assassination, they decided they would kill him the next day. The Audubon, why the Audubon, they said, according to Harry, he said, because they knew he would be there. It was as simple as that. The night before they met, they planned their strategy. They divided up assignments. Hare had actually gotten the guns because of his connections previously in 1963, hadn't been arrested and all of that. And they just divided up the assignments. Um, they visited the Audubon that night, and they looked at escape routes, you know, there was a dance there that night and got a feel for it. And then they, the next morning, they divided up assignments and they set out for Patterson. According to police reports, they got there around 1.45, which is an hour and 15 minutes before the assassination took place. Um, and they had a very simple strategy. Three of them had guns, a 38. Uh, a 45 and a J.C. Higgins sawed off double burst uh, shotgun. And the goal was that the two who did not have no guns, they were supposed to go in first, which they did. But if they were being searched, if they were to be searched, then the other three would have just turned around and they would not have tried to kill them that day. But what happened was the first two went in, they wasn't checked, and then the other three with their guns were able to just slip on in and they took their seats, you know, hair. Hare, Hare and, and Davis sat on the left-hand side. And by the way, there was a, another person with them who Hare hasn't talked about, but which we've been able to just, you know, piece together through different sources. And that was Linwood, Linwood X, who was the lieutenant of Moss Number 25, who was apparently part of all of this as well. So Hare and Davis sat on the left-hand side. Linwood sat on the right-hand side. He had, you know, and he appears to have been more of a uh, more of a smoke screen than anything because he had an FOI pin that drew attention. So people were kind of watching him, and therefore, you know, that was more for preoccupation, I think. Um, <clears throat> and about the fourth row was uh, Willie Bradley, who had the shotgun, and then behind him was uh, Ben, and then. Wilbur McKinley, and their strategy, you know, very, very simple, you know. First they sat through Benjamin's speech, and then once Benjamin's speech came, they were gonna cause a, a distraction. They had developed a, this, you know, they had, they had developed a, what people thought was a smoke bomb. Really all it was was they had taken a, a pack of matches. Okay, so what they ended up doing was they, you know, people thought it was a smoke bomb, but actually all it was, it was a sock. It had, it had matches in it. It had film and probably some other material that would um, burn real, real quickly. And then what they did was they just kind of lit it. And then right before it, you know, all of the matches were activated, you know, they threw it and it, it created the aura of a bomb. And of course, um, 
as they made the disturbance, you know, one person accused somebody of, you know, putting their hand in their pocket, and then the other person threw the smoke bomb, and then that created a certain amount of, uh, of energy in the room, distracted Malcolm, distracted many people were turning to look, and which was, a per you know, which was apparently the whole key to that, was because as people started looking toward the back and toward the center, it allowed the people who were sitting on, you know, the killers in the front row and in the fourth row to just stand up and shoot Malcolm without people really getting as good a shot at them if they just stood up right in front of everybody, you know, in the presentation and stuff. And of course, you know, all, you know, all hell broke loose. Now, there's one other element in all of this that's very significant, which I address in my book. And that is, we have to account for at least two of the guards. There were actually more, but two guards in particular need to be addressed. One was a man by the name of Robert 35X Smith. Okay. The other one's name was um, Charles 25X Blackwell. Both of them were former members of Jersey, Jersey Mosque. And what's going to happen is they're the two. They had just had a restationing of the guards right before the shooting took place. And so one of them were the Rostam guards. Now, what's important here for us to understand is that these men recognize apparently all of the assassins according to one person, but most likely, if not all of them, at least some of the assassins. And they basically did nothing. They said nothing uh, other than to maybe one or two people after the assassination. Um, and we have no evidence that they took any steps to try to see that justice was served, whether they went through the law enforcement or on their own. And this has always been one of the more baffling aspects of Malcolm's assassination. That is, that two of his own people, for that, you know, as far as things go, um, would, I mean, in other words, this is how I look at this. And I think that there is some question of accountability that I think needs to be addressed. You would have to find it very odd. If you're a Rostam guard, and remember now, you're looking at the audience. That's your job. That's what you're supposed to be up there doing, looking at the audience, looking for any type of challenges, any type of faces, but you know, particularly people from the nation. That was your job, by the way. Your major job was to make sure nobody from the nation snuck in who could cause trouble. That's your job. And you're recognizing this man over here. I remember him from the mosque. I think I remember that man from the mosque, the person sitting next to him. I think I remember him from the mosque. Antennas should have went up. We have no evidence, of course, you know, that, that, that no antennas went up. And in fact, according to Joseph, Yusuf Shaw, who died a few months ago, Captain Joseph during the, you know, during the 1960s, Joseph contends that, that one of the fears that the assassins had was right before the assassination, they were constantly, he said that the assassins were constantly looking at the two Rostam guards, wondering if they were going to turn them in, wondering if they were going to say something, wondering if there was somebody of, you know, putting their hand in their pocket, and then the other person threw the smoke bomb, and then that created a certain amount of, uh, of energy in the room, distracted Malcolm, distracted many people were turning to look, and which was, a per you know, which was apparently the whole key to that was because as people started looking toward the back and toward the center, it allowed the people who were sitting on, you know, the killers in the front row and in the fourth row to just stand up and shoot Malcolm without people really getting as good a shot at them if they just stood up right in front of everybody, you know, in the presentation and stuff. And of course, you know, all, you know, all hell broke loose. Now, there's one other element in all of this that's very significant, which I address in my book. And that is, we have to account for at least two of the guards, there were actually more, but two guards in particular need to be addressed. One was a man by the name of Robert 35X Smith. Okay. The other one's name was um, Charles 25X Blackwell. Both of them were former members of Jersey, Jersey Mosque. And what's going to happen is they're the two, they had just had a restationing of the guards right before the shooting took place. And so one of them were the Rostam guards. Now, what's important here for us to understand is that these men recognize 
Apparently, all of the assassins occurred to one person, but most likely, if not all of them, at least some of the assassins. And they basically did nothing. They said nothing uh, other than to maybe one or two people after the assassination. Um, and we have no evidence that they took any steps to try to see that justice was served, whether they went through the law enforcement or on their own. And this has always been one of the more baffling aspects of Malcolm's assassination. That is, that two of his own people, for that, you know, as far as things go, um, would, I mean, in other words, this is how I look at this. And I think that there is some question of accountability that I think needs to be addressed. You would have to find it very odd. If you're a Rostam guard, and remember now, you're looking at the audience. That's your job. That's what you're supposed to be up there doing, looking at the audience, looking for any type of challenges, any type of faces, but you know, particularly people from the nation. That was your job, by the way. Your major job was to make sure nobody from the nation snuck in who could cause trouble. That's your job. And you're recognizing this man over here. I remember him from the mosque. I, I think I remember that man from the mosque. The person sitting next to him, I think I remember him from the mosque. Antennas should have went up. We have no evidence, of course, you know, that, that, that no antennas went up. And in fact, according to Joseph, Yusuf Shaw, who died a few months ago, Captain Joseph, during the, you know, during the 1960s, Joseph contends that, that one of the fears that the assassins had was right before the assassination, they were constantly, he said that the assassins were constantly looking at the two Rostam guards wondering if they were going to turn them in, wondering if they were going to say something, wondering if they were going to call some of their people up and say, look, 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 we need to check this man, that man, and that man. That's what Joseph said. By the way, Joseph, you know, received a phone call right after the assassination. Um, within moments of the, he said less than 10 minutes after the assassination, he received a phone call giving him a step-by-step -step blow of how everything was pulled off. Uh, what a, what um, I suggest happen is the person who made that phone call was Linwood, the lieutenant. But the point is, is that we have to account for that. In other words, Malcolm's men, and by the way, one of those men, um, Robert 35X Black, uh, Robert 35X Smith is going to come into some money right after the assassination, even though he had no means of employment. He was wearing $100 suits, according to some of Malcolm's people. Never was, never testified. Uh, he ended up leaving, going south somewhere, and ultimately he did time for something else, and by that time the trial was over. The other person that was also interesting, Charles 25X Blackwell, will later emerge as one of two star witnesses who's going to finger Butler and Johnson and Hare, but especially Butler and Johnson, when it's very clear that this man knew that neither one of these men had anything to do with this assassination. The other thing that I think is important here, too, is that um, is that Blackwell's testimony, his grand jury testimony, is going to be different from his trial testimony. Similarly, um, Kerry Thomas, who was another, he was another Jersey Muslim who would have recognized these assassins as well, who was sitting in a booth at the time of the assassination, his grand jury testimony also was different from his trial testimony. The truth of the matter is, is that when you study the trial of Malcolm's assassins, or his alleged assassins, it becomes very clear that only a very unsophisticated, a very unreasonable jury would have accepted the flimsiness, the weaknesses, the contradictions, and the, the non-credibility of the witnesses. If you study the, okay. Is this okay out there? See, that's the travesty in all this. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, Charles X. Blackwell, could you also talk about the fact that I understand that he was the one who picked up Malcolm that day in the uh, in the car outside of the RKO, and that also, besides. When they came to the stage, instead of fighting them like a, like an FOI member would have, he dropped to his knees. 
and let the man with the shotgun blow Malcolm away. Have you ever heard that? No, I never heard that he, he dropped to his knee. What he basically said, I mean, put it this way. According to his testimony, he said that for the most part, uh, okay, he didn't say he dropped his knee. What he said was that he crouched over. That was the exact words that he used during the trial. Um, let's broaden the picture here. Malcolm's security was inept at best. They proved to be amateurs. And they broke rules that, remember that most of his security, you know, were basically former FOIs. And one of the things that they know is, is that when there's a disturbance, your priority isn't the disturbance, your priority is the speaker. They just basically, that just left them, A. And then B, the other thing, though, is that the security itself was not really set up to have Malcolm's back covered. There's no kind way of really putting this. How else are you going to explain the distance between Malcolm and his security, A? And remember, now, you're talking about a man whose house was firebombed a week earlier. A man, you know, who, you know, attempts had been made on his life for the last year or so. Uh, there was a, I mean, everybody knew about it. Everybody, I mean, uh, some of his own followers had been beaten up by members of, I mean, it was ridiculous that security was as non-existent as it actually was. And that made it so easy for the assassins to do what they needed to do. And then the other thing is that once everything happened, you know, we need to appreciate someone like Reuben Francis because he pulled out his piece. And, you know, and the truth of the matter is that the audience probably did more. And these are just rank and file members or, or just people who just came just to hear Malcolm. They probably did more than Malcolm's security in apprehending Hare. Because if it was just left up to uh, Malcolm's security, with few exceptions, people like George Whitney did a good job, you know. Um, Hale Roberts did a decent job, and, and he was an agent. Um, in apprehending the assassins. But when it came to some of Malcolm's people, like Blackwell, people like Thomas, who would later lie and finger two innocent men, Malcolm didn't have no security. Um, let's, let's get to actually who Hare fingered. Yeah, and who these, who these men were, um, who they are, what happened, what okay. happened to them. What your experiences Ooh. are okay. yeah. with following their path. Yeah. Um, in 1989, I did my best to try to get as much information as I could on the men that Hare named. Uh, for a few of them, it wasn't as difficult. For others, uh, well, for one in particular. Um, first off, Ben Thomas. Um, Ben Thomas, you know, was the assistant secretary of Moss Number 25. He was also the treasurer of the Patterson Mosque. And he ultimately became a pretty prominent person in the black community in Patterson, New Jersey. During the uh, late 70s, early 80s, he ended up moving to Florida. And it's going to be, even though he would still come back, his family, you know, he had a pretty large family. They still live in the Newark, New Jersey, I mean, in the Patterson, New Jersey area, by the way. Um, Thomas will ultimately be killed on October 28, 1986, in a small town outside of Orlando, Florida, called Apopka. Uh, and it was some type of domestic dispute. Uh, it was him, it was a young lady, and it was a man around 28 years old. And there's going to be a, f a fight between him and a man apparently having something to do with this lady. This is public information, so I don't mind talking about it. You know, you can read about it in the, if you, if you look at the Orlando Sentinel, Sentinel you know, you can, you can just read about that. Uh, October 29th, 1986. At any rate, um, and he took a 357 Magnum to the head. Now, I met a couple people who knew Thomas, all of them pretty much described him the same way. They said uh, he was a very, um, a very serious-minded person. He was the type of person that, um, if you wanted something done, 
in a serious way, in a professional way, no questions asked, in a discreet way, but in a competent way, you give it to him. Uh, he was also the type of person that people simply did not mess with. He was the type of person that um, you couldn't even ask personal questions. He wasn't that type of person. In other, in other words, he was not approachable. That was, you know, he had a certain aura about him, which I think probably helps explain why he was probably one of the people who was selected to be the point person in all of this. Leon Davis had developed a reputation in the Patterson area prior to the assassination as a young Muslim uh, who got into a fight in a pool room. Uh, he was apparently selling papers with another fellow Muslim. And some people said something negative about Elijah Muhammad or someone. And a fight ensued. And uh, he, to hear one person say it, he cleaned house. And therefore, that gave him a certain sense of notoriety in the Patterson, New Jersey area, which probably explains why he was selected as part of the assassination team. Of course, Talmadge Hare, you know, is pretty well documented. You know, he was in and out of trouble. Uh, but he was someone who was, who was viewed on, you know, as just a good brother who would take chances, who would take risks. Um, and then there was Willie Bradley. He was known in the Newark. He was from Newark. Unlike Thomas, Davis, and Hare, Bradley was from Newark. And he's about 28 at the time of assassination. And, you know, he was known as the stick-up man in Newark. Um, one of the questions that I've raised, which I asked a Newark, a former Newark police officer, was, you know, everybody who talked about the assassination said, you know, who witnesses said that Bradley fired the shotgun like a pro. I mean, he fired from the hip, he was crouched, I mean, he, he knew how to handle a shotgun. And I was curious, where does someone, you know, where does an urban, where does an urbanite in 1965 you know, 28 years old, learn how to use a gun like that. And because I, I was just very curious about that, because I was wondering, does that have intelligence written on it somewhere, intelligence apparatus, intelligence training, something like that? But I think one cop said that if he was from the South, that would not have been unusual. And one thing we do know is we know Harris people came from the South. We know uh, um, Thomas people came from Florida. That's why he ended up going back to Florida. Uh, and so it appears, I mean, you know, and of course, if we just understand the demographics and the history of, of African people in the United States, you know that a lot of us came out of the South. So when you put that into it, it doesn't become as much of a mystery. Nonetheless, i am still been very curious about that. The person who I, who I, I have been given, and, and by the way, Bradley later, you know, he, he went in and out of trouble. And... Most recently, I guess during the last few years, you know, I had attempted to try to locate him. Uh, and I used some contacts that I had. Uh, I had a former student, you know, who's a policeman, local policeman where, where I live. And he, you know, tried to get me some information. And I had heard, uh, I knew someone who knew someone who was related to Bradley. And they said that, as far as they know, he was, he was still locked up, apparently in, uh, I think they said Cardwell. Cardway, Card, Cardwell, Cardwell in New Jersey, somewhere in the you know, Newark area, I would assume. Um, but he had been transferred, you know, once or twice or what have you. But as of a few years ago, he was still locked up um, for not Malcolm, for some other crimes that he committed. The person that I've been able to get the least information about was the person who had the firebomb or the smoke bomb, whatever you want to call it. And who was also the oldest member of the assassin team. Of course, that was Wilbur Kinley or Mud Kinley. Uh, and he was the one who also owned the, um, the construction company in Newark, longtime resident of Newark. I met one person who said they remember that name and they think he died during the early 1970s. I spent. Uh, a couple days one time going through records during the early 70s, seeing if I can come across, you know, going through the, um, the, um, the Newark Ledger, what's it called, Ledger, Star, Star Ledger, Star Ledger. right? 
uh, looking for obituaries or anything. Um, I went through the records, you know, looking for it. And part of the challenge is that, you know, we had to cross-reference his name, and that makes it very difficult. Is it McKinley or is it Kinley? Is it Willie? Was it Wilbur? Harry didn't give us a whole lot of information. I suspect, though, within the next few years, we will be able to get more information about him. And, it, and I would assume he's probably, you know, that what somebody said probably was true. He probably, he probably would be dead by now, but you just never can tell. It's interesting, too. When I was doing my research in 89, I visited um, a restaurant that Davis had visited the week before. In fact, I, I, I was told he was sitting right where I was sitting. So he still lives in the Newark area. Um, and from what I can gather, you know, he's a businessman. Um, again, he's not the type of person, you know, when Harris Affidavit went public, um, according to one source that I know, Thomas and Davis were both in Newark at the time. I mean, in Patterson at the time. And what happened was they kind of dropped out of sight for a little while. But I asked the person, I said, well, did anybody ever approach them about, about it? He said, no. I, you know, and, and then they explained because they weren't the type of people that you could approach that about. So um, I think that's probably revealing um, that they did go incognito after it became public. We understand from people that we've talked to who visited with, I guess it was Willie Bradley, or Davis, or whoever was in jail. Bradley. Um, people who were part of Ma Malcolm's inner circle, that they went and visited them and asked them to please say what they knew so that they could get Norman and Thomas out of jail, and they refused. And we have this on tape that people have done this. Um, what would, wouldn't that negate all of their, if they didn't go ahead and do that, okay, they two brothers, if they didn't go ahead and recant, uh, or try to get them out and let them sit there for 20 years in jail, wouldn't that negate any legitimate, any legitimacy that they had towards a greater love of Allah or a greater love of Elijah Muhammad himself? I mean, it would, it would make the whole assassination of Malcolm X they wouldn't be true believers anymore. They'd just be thugs. And what's your comment about that? Yeah, well, I think uh, there are probably several factors involved as to why, you know, none of them was beaten down the door to say, I did it. Um, I, think, I think one of the factors is that, remember that Butler and Johnson were both viewed as soldiers who were just being asked to make a sacrifice. And, you know, they were deemed the ones who were supposed to make the sacrifice. And even though I, Ben Thomas, or I, Leon Davis, you know, was a real killer, and they didn't really kill him, um, you know, that's life. And when you join the nation, that's just how things are, and that's the, that's the end of the story. Now, one thing did happen, though, that I think does play another role in all of this, and that is, remember that, by the time these men are going to be approached, and remember, they're going to be approached late 1979 or at least late 1979 because prior to that, but, uh, Hare had not talked, and therefore we wouldn't know to try to find Butler, Davis, or anybody else. By the time they were approached, though, a lot had happened inside the nation. There were a lot of changes. And a lot of that loyalty and love that some, you know, many of these members were not even members of the nation when that happened. Some ended up going with Wallace. Some just broke out altogether. In fact, from what I understand, Thomas and Davis, you know, both by the time you got to the early 80s, I mean, uh, uh, late 70s, were not all that active inside the different splinter groups anyway. So when you bring that into it, some of that loyalty that might have existed in 1965, 66, 67, 68 doesn't necessarily exist now. And then the other thing, too, is, is that at that stage, for whatever reason that you kill Malcolm, you know, you're not going to be all that interested in giving up your freedom. Uh, because, you know, if, if, put it this way, if it was about a cause and you were really committed, you could also look at it from the standpoint that maybe they should have given themselves up right away. But I think human beings being what they are, um, I would have thought that it would have been very, very unusual if they would have given themselves up, A. And then B, the other thing is that, remember now, the authorities wasn't exactly all that interested 
in this whole story anyway. You know, so even if they, I mean, you know, even if they admitted it, and you know, and uh, the chances of the NYPD or the district attorney's office or somebody like that really allocating resources to reopening the case and all that, um, I think would have been very, very, very neo. And then, and then B, the NYPD and the district attorney would also have to explain then, you know, if you got the wrong people, we need to go over this and explain what exactly, you know, how did you end up getting the wrong people? I think that would open up a can of worms as well that nobody would have been all that interested in pursuing. Why, why was Butler and Johnson the ones fingered and chosen? Yeah. Apparently more than any other reason was because, you know, they both in January, you know, in a January, good, in January 1965, a month before the assassination, they were um, both arrested, along with a few other brothers, for shooting a man by the name of Benjamin Brown, who was a, um, a uh, parole officer who had left the nation and then who had apparently put up some type of a picture of, of Elijah Muhammad in, in his window front, and that was viewed as him basically um, being like a heretic. And so he was shot, and Butler and Johnson were part of all of that. And so they already had these two men, they were already um, you know, brought up, and it was very convenient. In other words, it made it very easy for their case, because we already got evidence of these men going after defectives, you know, defectors, going after heretics, going after hypocrites, going after Malcolm's people or people who they could easily say were Malcolm's people. So I think that made them a very easy target. And then B, they were, they were very well known. Anybody who had anything to do with, with the nation or who left to join Malcolm knew about Butler and Johnson. Could you tell us your conversations with Norman Butler and or Thomas Johnson over the years and what their feelings are about their incarceration and do they still proclaim their innocence to this day? Oh yeah, well, you know, first off, we should expect them to proclaim their innocence because they were innocent. Um, I've really only had the opportunity to talk to Butler during the last several months. Uh, in fact, it was uh, Yosef Shaw's funeral that uh, I was able to be put in contact with, with Butler. Um, you know, Butler uh, is very sharp. Um, he's very analytical, and he seems to have a very, um, very qualitative understanding of, you know, what has happened, and he seems to put it all in perspective very well. Um, as he told Peter Goldman when, when uh, Goldman went into the prisons during the late 1970s, you know, he viewed him, you know, you know, he viewed himself as a soldier who was suffering, and, 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 and he was suffering real bad. Uh, he was a victim of circumstances. Um, obviously, he's not real pleased about his situation, and, and I think that he feels that there needs to be some type of compensation. Um, he knew that people were lying on him. He knew they were lying on Johnson. Um, but at the same time, he also realized that, um, you know, it reached a point in the trial in which it dawned on him and it dawned on Johnson that it really didn't matter that people were lying, that they were basically going to go. My overall perspective, by the way, is, is that whoever they would have arrested was going to do time, regardless of the testimony, you know, which was ridiculous at best. And, uh, you know, so at any rate, one of the things that I'm interested in doing myself personally is to have some type of a campaign, some type of a way for this injustice, you know, to be brought to the fore. And there needs to be some type of, you know, some type of retribution. Something needs to happen as far as the NYPD, as far as the district attorney's office is concerned, whether it's financial, whether it's just public acknowledgement for what they did, something really needs to be done because you've taken half of two people's lives. And understand me clearly, Butler and Johnson, neither one of them had halos on their head. They were, you know, they were doing, you know, they were beating up people and they were part of that whole, you know, environment, if you will, as far as Malcolm's people were concerned and all that. But they did not kill Malcolm and yet they have both, you know, one of them, you know, got out in 85, the other one got out in 1987. So they spent 
20 something, you know, 20 and 22 years of their life for, you know, doing time for something that they didn't do. And, and there's no justice in that, especially when you realize that the NYPD, they knew that these men were, were innocent. And of course, I was, you know, the, the FBI also knew. In fact, in one document, the Bureau says that the reason that they did not, on the day, the day after Butler was arrested, which was February 27th, 1965, the Bureau said that they were not able, you know, to place Butler or Johnson in the vicinity of the Audubon. That's why they didn't bother interviewing either man. And yet that same Bureau is then going to help to provide evidence to convict both of these men. Some hanky panky is going on. Do you think that the, can you give us, <clears throat> instead of just the Newark mosques participation in this, other, go on. Like that would be hard pressed to deliver on that, would be the, well, you said it, the can of worms. Because remember now, this could set a precedent that uh, there's a lot of people out there, you know, who were victimized by Cointel Pro, who right now have no type of redress. A couple of them for a quick bite here from you. Um, if, if there was, uh, what would be the problems associated, just as what we were just talking about, what would be the problems associated with reopening this case with the with the FBI, with the Department of Justice and with the NYPD and local courts and federal courts, congressional hearings, what would be the problems, what would be the benefits to Butler and Johnson? Yeah. Um, I think all of this raises an important question. And the question is, you know, how do you, in fact, re, you know, how do you um, offer redress to a butler and a Johnson. How do you offer register, you know, to a Malcolm at this stage of the game? Well, clearly we can at least address the question of Butler and Johnson. Um, I'm like, you know, I like many people would like to see the people who are responsible as far as the intelligence community is concerned, as far as the NYPD is concerned, and as far as the Nation of Islam is concerned, I would like to see those people held accountable for their actions. Um, if it could result in them doing time, time fine. Uh, electric chair, you know, frankly, I don't particularly give a damn, you know, how they're, you know, as long as there's some type of accountability. Now, as far as this whole issue of, you know, the intelligence community, uh, you know, is concerned, you know, one of the weaknesses in the intelligence community today, and I'm, I'm speaking basically, you know, as a, you know, as an, as a, you know, as a person, you know, who has studied the intelligence community, who's very much committed, you know, to my people and in combating the intelligence community. One of the challenges that we run into is that there's very little redress that we have when we have been victimized by the intelligence community. There have been, of course, civil suits, as what happened in the case of, you know, um, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark's assassination, you know, they were awarded, their family was awarded money, but that was civil damages. The people who were responsible, which was clearly criminal. Hold on a second. Okay. But as far as criminal charges are concerned, there's really no redress when it comes to that. In other words, at best, the state might say, okay, we, it is true that because of this operation, you know, as in the case of Mark Clark or Fred Hampton, these men were killed, and we now admit that, yes, we, we acted very negligently, we acted very, you know, but that's civil. And therefore, the people who, who are responsible for all that, they can just go on about their business and stuff, even though technically, I don't care how you look at it, that was a damn murder. In fact, it was, it was in fact, two murders. You shooting somebody while they sleep. Fred Hampton never even woke up. Not to mention the fact that he was also drugged by a person who was on the FBI payroll. So I'm saying all that to say that it's going to be very difficult based upon contemporary times for the government to just come clean in all of this and then to be held accountable for its action. Now, 
I agree that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't work toward it, but hell, we still got political prisoners. We got people like Geronimo Pratt, who's been in jail since the early 1970s for doing something that COINTELPRO documents generally suggest he didn't do. And yet nothing is done, even though people protest every year, we, you know, we, we raise money every year. So at, at any rate, you know, it's a very frustrating um, position to be in. But I think that clearly we need to continue to work as far as people like Butler and Johnson are concerned. And unfortunately, there are a lot of Butlers and Johnson. The difference between them and others is that, you know, most of the Butlers and Johnson did not kill someone as important to the African community as a Malcolm X. But we have a lot of people out there, uh, you know, even, you know, even white radicals who are doing time because of Cointel Pro type of operations who have no real redress. So I think that if, if from a documentary film like this, if a campaign can come out in which we can finally begin to lay Malcolm to rest as far as, you know, you know, dealing with his, you know, with his assassination and resolving his assassination and holding people accountable, then I think that it would be worth it. And to be honest, that's, you know, that's one of the major reasons why I decided to participate in this. And I think that people are just really gonna have to to roll up their sleeves because let's be honest, you know, anybody who, you know, who studied whether it's Congress, because most congressional hearings, they at best might get to the surface. I think that the United States government has proven that it generally cannot investigate itself. And I think clearly the courts have shown that it cannot even really investigate the intelligence community. Why? Because usually they got this you know, this extraordinary blanket called national security. And if we allow this to happen, then we're gonna be jeopardizing national security. And generally, that's what they've used in the past. And for us to bring out this information, yes, it might help to get this person off, but it might jeopardize a source. All the, you know, all these, you know, games and jokes and things like that. And so long as they play with games like this, you know, we should not expect a whole lot to come out of campaigns like this. Um. Let's talk about who actually, what your best bet is, whether it was a, uh, an atmosphere created and then exacerbated by articles in, and in Muhammad Speaks, or whether it was actually this, this uh, some of Elijah's sons with John Lee, Raymond Sharif. Can you also talk about John Lee being in New York? visiting Malcolm's hotel room, or visiting Malcolm's hotel, there's allegations about that. Uh, and also yeah. talk about, uh, did, he, did he visit them with, Tal did he visit that place with Talmadge Hare, which has also been alleged. Okay. Um, as far as the, the organization of the assassination, with regard to the Nation of Islam is concerned. Um, what my sources suggest is that it came from the top, that is the Chicago leadership, um, and it basically worked its way down. Now, one of the questions that I address in my book is the question of Elijah Muhammad's culpability and everything. And this is how I handle that. Elijah Muhammad made statements similar to senior officials in the United States government, which to the right ear could be deemed that this man wants me to take care of this person. He made statements at a conference that took place in October 1964. He made statements to people over the telephone. And he also made similar statements, though more guarded, in Muhammad Speaks in several articles. He also made a speech in June 1964 that was circulated throughout the Nation of Islam in Houston in which he said that the hypocrites were gonna be blasted off the face of the earth and the, you know, and, and the chief hypocrite he alluded to was, was Malcolm. Um, so clearly we have to um, bring Elijah Muhammad into all of this. And of course, this is the other challenge. Even if someone can later say, well, he didn't mean, he didn't mean for Malcolm to be killed and all of this, you're still gonna run a problem because he knew better than anybody that the nation worked on post-suggestion, that the nation, that is the FOI, worked 
on, you know, on dropping seeds or planting seeds, that it worked on energy, and that they didn't oftentimes use direct orders. They would just say certain things, but the people would interpret it as direct orders. That would have been irresponsible at best for him to put out that type of energy if he did not want Malcolm's assassination on his head. So I think that when you deal with assassination of Malcolm X, it really, you have to deal with the top. And of course, the Chicago leadership itself, uh, John Ali, you know, who, who tended to always appear, you know, whenever Malcolm was somewhere, you know, he, you know, John Ali, you know, when he was in, for example, when he was in Los Angeles, there was John Ali. You know, he spoke in, in Cleveland, there was John Ali. John Ali tended to be appearing when Malcolm was basically speaking. And of course, he was in, in New York, according to certain sources, uh, during the assassination and then left, you know, on the evening of the assassination. Uh, I think we probably need to account for that. I think, you know, frankly, I think John Ali was one of the point people. Uh, he, was, he was one of the supervisors, as was Captain Joseph, who was another major player in all of this. Um, Elijah Muhammad Jr. was a major player. Um, you know, he's the one that told a June 1964 FOI meeting that Malcolm, you know, you know, needed to have his tongue cut out and knock, you know, and go to his home and beat down the doors and cut out his tongue and send it to him and he would get his stamp approved and give it to his father. He was a major player in all of this. Um, as well. Uh, Raymond Sharif, I've gotten mixed messages. He was the supreme captain of the FOI. I've gotten mixed messages as to whether or not he was just, uh, uh, you know, just being used and everything or whether or not he was really actively participating. But the Chicago leadership clearly was in the forefront. And of course, what they would do would simply trinkle down the energy to the captains when there was a captain in the mosque or to the lieutenants when there wasn't a captain in the mosque, to the secretaries, and in some cases to the ministers, depending on how prominent the minister was. Um, and so it ultimately worked its way down to places like Newark. But of course, you know, it appears that Buffalo uh, had a squad. Philadelphia had people who were ready as well. There was attempts made when he was in Los Angeles as well. Um, and of course, New York had different people, even though New York would have been the most risky to have a team. And we also need to deal with the house bombing as well. That probably, most likely, see, the way that the nation worked during this period of time is they liked to import people from the outside to deal with more eternal things, like the, you know, more localized challenges like this. The major muscle centers of the nation when they wanted to import was Buffalo, Philadelphia, New York, when it wasn't in New York, Newark. They all had reputations for being major muscle centers. When you needed something done, call in some of these people. I think that the house bombing, now I've gotten, you know, the, uh, there were like several ministers admitted that the nation bombed it. Of course, Captain Joseph admitted um, during the filming for you know, the Malcolm X movie that the nation bombed, bombed the house, even though nobody wants to drop names and things. But my best understanding is that most likely it would have been imported, that the house bombers would have been imported. And by the way, it's very clear that the nation bombed, you know, bombed, you know, Malcolm's house, even though the NYPD and the nation tried to make it appear as though Malcolm bombed his own house. And of course, you know, Bruce Perry in, in, in his book bought that. That was a scheme, but he bought it nonetheless. Uh, but no, um, the nation bombed his house, and apparently that was, you know, that was an attempt. Probably not a high strategic attempt, but it was an attempt apparently to, you know, to kill Malcolm. Now, as far as you know, people like John Ali are concerned, um, I think Ali was a major point person, uh, as I alluded to earlier. Um, although I would like to address the question of him being an agent. I, I don't think John Ali was an agent. And one of the major reasons is that um, um, Paul Lee and myself came, uh, came across a, a document um, in which the Bureau uh, is excited because for the first time they're saying they finally have someone who's going to be close to Elijah Muhammad. 
and who would be able to give them information. In other words, they didn't call him and inform him anything. They said this person was a source. And this is right after the assassination, like March 19, 1965. And so they're very excited. Well, of course, it goes without saying. Um, if they already had John Ali as an FBI informant, there would not have been a whole lot of jumping up and down. Uh, hurrah, hurrah, now we get to learn more about the eternal dynamics uh, from the leadership, from a leadership standpoint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no, I don't think John Ali was FBI. I think John Ali, uh, you know, was NOI all the way. And I think at the same time, though, he was very materialistic and he milked the NOI as best he could until he, I think he was finally set down in the early 1970s. Um, but, um, you know, and I think that, you know, Lewis Lomax put us into that line with, you know, in his book in 1963, When the Word Was Given. But uh, I think that we need a lot more information before I would be convinced that John Ali was anybody's FBI agent. I think he was working for Elijah Muhammad, uh, and I think that he was probably a true blue uh, Muslim. Um, let's see, you want to hear anything else? Questions, Eric? Um, based on your reason. Yeah. Now, one of the most difficult challenges anybody studying, you know, intelligence, the intelligence apparatus runs into is trying to um, identify the sources. And the Bureau makes that difficult. A, because the Bureau gives people, <clears throat> gives informants uh, codes, codes names. Like one code name might be. Um, usually it has a, a, around seven letters. Five of those letters would be, five, two would be um, some type of acronym or an initial for the type, you know, is, you know, A, could it be a security informant? Could it be a racial informant? Communist infiltrating informant, et cetera. And then the other ones would just be the, the number or the, well, <clears throat> the, actually the, the office, that is, for example, Atlanta. The Atlanta plant in, say, Martin Luther King's organization, in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a man by the name of Jim Harrelson. His code name was AT, which denoted Atlanta. And then, uh, and, and then he had like around, I guess it was five different, you know, five different numbers. Now, this is what messes everything up. The Bureau uses these numbers, I mean, excuse me, uses these codes not just for human plants, but they also use it for electronic plants. And of course, this is so later, if you're trying to figure out, is this a human source or is this some type of microphone? Or is this some type of electronic bug or something like that? It makes it very, very, very difficult. Um, now, what we do know is, is that in 1965, inside the Nation of Islam, Malcolm Black Nationalist Arena in New York City, the Bureau had 33 informants reporting on information. Um, now, it is interesting, though. We've come across two informants, or, or they were actually temporary informants, which meant that um, they had not achieved the level of being permanent at that stage, who identified Butler as an assassin. Now, what we've been curious about is the possibility that one or more, you know, one or the other one of these people may have been one of the witnesses. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have enough information. And of course, they're never going to release the type of documents that would allow us to really be able to, to figure out with the accuracy that we would like. Now, Paul Lee has probably done more research than anybody in the area of trying to figure out who some of these people were. And, and he seems pretty convinced that he's identified at least a few, particularly from the Philadelphia. You know, Philadelphia had a very important informant. And Paul seems very convinced, and um, I tend to uh, agree that he's probably, you know, that he has I, I identified that person. But that's through, you know, ex, you know, that's through extraordinary means, not based upon those documents, but just based upon who could have been in this meeting at a certain time, because this person has identified all of the people in this meeting, and therefore we can account for this person, that person, that person, but there's one other person we can't account for, and that person was sons of da. But of course, that requires you know you know you know very um, you know I mean that's detective work. Could we take a break for a couple of minutes? Sure. And, all right. Let, I, I would like to, and then we, we we're just going to jump back and forth here, you know. But I'd like to talk about what happened.
from what we understand, there was a there was a war going on within the nation, a civil war. Was it a grab for power? Do you know much about this war and how many people were taken out? We know Leon Forex and Mayor was taken out. We know other people died mysteriously or, and very violently throughout the years. Was this an internal power struggle within the nation for, for prominence? Was it revenge for Malcolm's demise? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what was this war? And, and we, there's also a report that a group called, the, called RAM um, was after people. And uh, that they had called uh, a reporter the morning of February 21st and said that Malcolm would be assassinated that day. It's in the Bossy files. Um, what, what are all these groups and, and, and what happened to the nation during all of these years? And because I'll tell you, nobody knows about any of this stuff. Was there something going on? How many people died? I mean, what was the war all about? Yeah, the nation, you know, like some organizations and maybe unlike some organizations, the nation had its eternal challenges uh, that sometimes led, you know, to violence. As many, you know, you've been hearing a lot of information about there being a war going on. I'm not so sure that I would call it a war. Uh, I think that's clearly there were some serious uh, power struggles going on inside the nation. Um, now, Wallace, Warren D. Muhammad contends that when he took over the nation uh, upon his, his father's death, one of the reasons that he did away with the FOI, he said, was because he came across at least 10 deaths that the FOI was directly related to, now, you know, participating in. And what, you know, what he determined in all of that, um, I think, was actually pretty consistent with the history. That is, um, some people did, in fact, you know, become um, casualties. But not necessarily because it was an organized vendetta or anything like that. It was, you know, for example, one person, you know, you can go back to the record, one person was killed during the fall of 1964 um, because uh, he and his brother and another person had left the nation, had joined Malcolm, became disenchanted, and then they were out and gotten into a confrontation. <laughs> Okay. And they got into a confrontation with some members of the nation. This one person, Kenneth Morton, took a blow to the head, and several weeks later he died from it. Well, see, that was a casualty, but it wasn't necessarily because of some, you know, clandestine power struggle or, or anything, you know, like that. It was just basically the FOI, you know, using force, using brute strength like they did uh, on Malcolm and other members, you know. Other members of Malcolm's, you know, who joined Malcolm can also talk about having confrontations, but that didn't necessarily always lead to, say, death. Now, there were, however, there, you can look into different phases, though, in which, in many ways, you probably could call it war. A good case, you could probably go back to 1973 across the river here in Newark. You know, they had, I think, what I would deem a war. You had two factions. One faction was from the nation. Another faction was from a splinter group from the nation. And there were many variables to this, but it ended up it you know it ended up with several people dying as a result, including the the uh, minister from Newark, Minister James James Shabazz or James McGregor was his or was his European name, but he ended up being a casualty in all of that. You know he was assassinated by members of the Splinter Group. So you do have cases like that, but I would be a little bit reserved though to to go beyond that. I think that the FOI was, was very muscle-oriented. They were heavy-handed, and I think that was one of the reasons why Wallace finally disbanded them. But it wasn't necessarily a real organized vendetta, if you will. They would just isolate certain people for whatever reason, and those were the ones who became those, you know, those uh, casualties. Excuse me for a moment, off the track. What's John Ellie's European name? Uh, you know? Simmons, John Simmons. not a war or a conflict or whatever. Do you think or do you believe in your research that that these this internal struggle was the result of religious orthodoxy, that certain people were 
breaking away into uh, into other uh, into other forms of Islam, or we're trying to get it back to certain was it re was it religion? Yeah, um, particularly in Newark, there was a religious component, there was a money component, there was also a power component. Uh, I think that Newark especially is is you know much more complex than say some of the other areas. For example, if you go to um, what also happened in 1973, if you went to Washington D.C. when the Hanafi Muslims were killed, you know the, the people who killed them came out of Philadelphia, and that was more, you know, that was more religion and that was more power and you know and people being upset that you know um, this you know former minister was challenging the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. I think that was probably much more simplified than what was happening over here in Newark. What about, what about the dope connection? Oh, okay. the policeman in Harlem right now uh -huh. who says that, and this isn't a direct source, it's a source to a source, who says that uh, that uh, that Malcolm, um, here he was out preaching and proselytizing in the community, not only in this country but around the world, um, talking about uh, Allah and Islam and religion and how it can clean up your life, how it can how it can make a, a man who uh, has criminal tendencies, how it can make him whole. And that he discovered that in a, that high-ranking members of the Nation of Islam, and that some members of different mosques, not just the New Jersey mosque, but other mosques, were dealing heroin, and that this um, caused some of his members to actually come to him and say that they wanted to kill these people. And we have that on tape. People who um, who had gone to Malcolm and said, you know, let's rid the community of dealers. And let's rid our own community of the corruption. And then we put you on top. And then you clean house once you get there. What do you have to say to that? Yeah. Um, my understanding of the nation of Islam and drugs is in the post Malcolm X period. Um, now, is, does that mean that it's not possible that it was happening during Malcolm's day? Uh, of course, it's possible. I mean, you know, and I'd be the first to admit that I don't know, you know, everything. But this is one gauge, though, which might lend credence to my contention. We've talked about how Malcolm was really throwing darts during the last month or so, as far as the nation is concerned. And I think that if he really had something like that. And I'm just, I'm just speculating here. I think he would have unleashed that. In other words, I think that would have also been a way, because remember now, he had no problems talking about how the nation would beat the hell out of people, particularly black people, you know, you know, which was one of the Achilles heels of the nation was that they would always go after, you know, they might beat the hell out of somebody like me, but they would always stay clear of the police, of the FBI, of the Klan, and of his white people in general. So Malcolm milked that. He also milked, you know, the whole question of Elijah Muhammad's, you know, mistresses and uh, adultery. He milked that. You know, he had no problems discussing that. And then, you know, he even pulled out this thing with Hunt, even though there ain't a whole lot of evidence with that, but that didn't stop him from necessarily going with that as well. I would suggest that if he had a lot of, you know, if, if he had information, even if it was just speculative at best, you know, because, hell, the Hunt thing was speculative at best, I think Malcolm would have probably went with it. No, I think that, that I think that what you're going to see happening is you're going to see the drug things happening after Malcolm's assassination, uh, as you get closer into the later part of the 1960s. Uh, you know, so you know that would be my, you know, that would be my response to that. We have information from other people that Fard Muhammad uh, was murdered, perhaps at the hands of Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. Well, you know, Bruce Perry argues that in his book, 
you know, on Malcolm, you know, on in his biography of Malcolm. And one of the things that he talks about is that it was it was uh, it was basically rumored, as far as evidence is concerned, uh, because you know you know Far Muhammad basically kind of like disappeared, as they like to say. And of course, it depends upon whether you're looking at it from a religious standpoint as opposed to a more you know, political standpoint will dictate whether or not he disappeared or whether or not he just went back, you know, into heavens, into the heavens or whatever, you, you know, he believed in and stuff. But I think at best, that's just speculation because we don't have a whole lot of information one way or another as to what became of him. And the bureau files, you know, I, I kind of